Today we're going to be talking about uh, Chapter 1 in our uh, CCNP Route Companion Guide. This chapter is fairly lengthy and we're dividing it up into two different parts. The first part is going to be longer than the second part. I expect that you have uh, your CCNA certification. However, I realize that some of you may have just certified or recertified last week. Others of, for others of you, it might have been a couple of years. And if you haven't looked at the CCNA uh, material for a couple of years, uh, maybe your job doesn't require that information or hasn't required that information, but now you're going to get your CCNP certification. I realize some of the material might be a little bit um, dusty in your brain, so to speak. So chapter one should be largely review, but it should be dusting off the cobwebs. Please keep in mind that this course is a an online course. It is not an independent study course. That means that if you have any questions anywhere along the lines, please, please, please feel free to ask. I'm going to be going fairly quickly through this chapter because I do expect that this is going to be a review for most, if not all, of you. Again, if I say anything in this chapter or other chapters that you don't understand, if you've read through the textbook, you really don't understand what's going on, please do feel free to contact me. You may have noticed that with a lot of textbooks, and Cisco Companion Guides are definitely included here, the first chapter has a very different feel from all of the subsequent chapters. Subsequent chapters focus on one topic, TCP or OSPF. But the first chapter, the only theme is, here's a bunch of information that might, you might find useful later on. And if you try to relate information from one part of the chapter to enough information learned in another part of the chapter, you'll have a very difficult time because the concepts might be tangentially related at best. That is definitely the case with this companion guide. There are a lot of different topics, uh, many of which are, are pretty much unrelated to the others. In this video, we are going to be discussing everything up to and including VPN overviews. The next video is going to focus on, in on the last two major bulleted points on this slide. This campus is typically going to be an individual building or maybe a group of buildings at a particular location. And within the enterprise campus, you're going to have not only servers, but your uh, workers on the campus are going to have uh, client devices that are going to be making use of the different servers. You also might have branch offices or teleworkers, people who are located off-site that wish to uh, make use of these servers. That's where the Enterprise Edge comes in. So the Enterprise Campus provides the resources to end users and devices. Um, typically, you're going to be having either a two or three layer hierarchical model where the access layer is going to involve um, connecting to your network, the end device is connecting to the network. The distribution layer might have, for example, ACLs in it. The core layer is designed for high-speed, reliable communication. If your organization is small, your distribution layer and your core layer might collapse. And the Enterprise Edge is basically the interface, if you will, between your campus and the wild outside world. It gives you the access to the internet. It also gives access to your servers outside of your campus. Again, branch office workers, teleworkers, and the like. You already know why you would need dynamic routing protocols if you have an organization that is of any size whatsoever. If you have more than a few routers, static routing is going to very rapidly become unwieldy. Ideally, you will use only one interior gateway protocol for your entire enterprise. We'll see later some reasons why your organization might wind up having more than one IGP at a time, but ideally you only have one. And very often the choice will be OSPF or EIGRP. If you have a very small organization, you might use RIP. If your organization is multi-homed, connected to more than one ISP, you're probably going to be running BGP, or Border Gateway Protocol. BGP being the only exterior uh, gateway protocol that's uh, commonly in use now, want to use. 
The first one is simply, are you communicating within your organization or between organizations? If you're communicating within your organization, you're going to be wanting to use an IGP. If you're communicating between your organization and your service provider, you might very well be using um, EGP, uh, specifically BGP. But how large your network is, not only now, but how large you think it might be in the future. RIP works wonderfully for a small organization. It's easy to configure, easy to understand. However, the larger your organization grows, the longer the convergence time is going to be. If you wind up having a hop count of 16 or higher, you're going to have connectivity problems because you'll recall RIP's metric is hop count, and 16 it considers to be infinity. So if you want a scalable routing protocol, you're not going to be wanting to use RIP. Once upon a time, I would have said that if you were using non-Cisco devices, you're not going to want to use EIGRP because EIGRP at one point was considered Cisco proprietary. Non-Cisco vendors would not be having EIGRP. Recently, however, Cisco has been sharing its protocol with other vendors. So at this point, you might very well find non-Cisco products running EIGRP. But there's no guarantee that they will. So if you have non-Cisco devices, you may or may not choose to be using EIGRP. You could use OSPF without, if you wish not to worry about interoperability uh, between vendors. Learning new protocols takes time, and it takes a certain amount of skill. And if you have someone trying to configure a routing protocol that they're not comfortable with, you might very well wind up having problems. So unless you can get that person training, Get, unless they can get themselves up to speed, you might wish to avoid a routing, particular routing protocol. Different routing algorithms, some um, such as OSPF will converge faster than others, such as, our, uh, such as RIP. We've already talked about scalability. We've talked about interior gateway protocols used with it solely within an organization. Exterior gate versus exterior gateway protocol, singular because it's going to be BGP these days that's used between organizations. Now, I will say that there are going to, can be some exceptions to this that we will be seeing through the semester, but for the most part, if you're within your organization, you're going to be using IGP. If you're communicating with your ISP, um, communicating with another organization, shared uh, routing information with another organization, you'd be using BGP as your EGP. You know that there are a large variety of uh, routing protocols. Uh, it, we're not going to be talking about RIP v2 um, or IPv4. That you should know about from CCNA. Depending on when you studied for your CCNA exam, you might know more or less about EIGRP, OSPF, RIP Next Generation. You probably, if all you know about routing is uh, what you've learned from the CCNA studies, you probably are not very familiar with BGP. We are going to be talking about everything that's in um, a red box as we go through the semester. You'll recall that distance vector protocols, how far they are away from a particular network and out of which interface to send packets destined to the network, and what the next top address is to get to the network. And that's all they know about getting something to that other network. It's like a road sign. Here, I can see 18, I'm assuming, kilometers to Killarney. And I can see I would have to go in this direction to get there. What, oh, what the terrain is like between here and there, the sign gives me no clue. In the case of RIP, distance is going to be uh, reckoned in hop counts. And we'll see, uses hop counts slightly differently than uh, the earlier versions of RIP. RIP makes use of the Delvin Ford algorithm. Link state protocols are like using a map. With a link state protocol such as OSPF, each router knows about each of the connections between pairs of routers. And based on that, they, it can figure out what different routes packets can take to get from itself to a particular destination. OSPF, open shortest path first, surprise, surprise, uses the shortest path first algorithm. 
router is represented by Oakland. We can look at look at its map, quote unquote. We see that we can send packets to Sacramento via this path or via this path, and it would determine which one would be the best one. Distance vector protocols and link state protocols should be very familiar to you from your CCNA studies. I imagine the path vector protocols are probably going to be new for you. With a path vector protocol, when one device is sending an update to another device to let it know about a network, it lets it know not only if you want to send packets to this network, send them through me, but it also says, lets it know, I will get it and I will send it to X, which will send it to Y, which will send it to Z, and it will eventually get to the destination in that manner. So the information is exchanged includes not just this is my metric to get to that location or I am connected to these other devices. Instead, it contains the information about exactly how a packet would go, what which paths it would traverse to get to its final destination. Path vector protocols are designed to have loop-free routing. If a router receives an update for a particular network and it sees the path to that network include, already included in that path is itself, it realizes that if it were to make use of that update information, a loop would be created, and so it won't use that update information. You already know that convergence a uh, state of convergence is reached when all of the routers have a consistent understanding of the topology. Maybe not an identical understanding, but a consistent one. Distance vector protocols are not going to have an identical understanding, but they will be consistent. Link state routing protocols are going to have a consistent and identical understanding. Just the time so that if a link goes up or down, it won't take very long before all of the routers know about it. And you can see some of them listed here. In addition to the more obvious things such as how many routers are there, how many routers does a particular router have as a neighbor, etc. Addressing the scheme makes a huge difference. You already saw in your CCNA studies how a good addressing scheme can make uh, VLSN much easier and how you can create summary routes much more easily if you've got a good addressing scheme. We'll be seeing something similar as we go through the semester. A unicast address refers to exactly one device. An, I, an IP source address is also always going to be a unicast address. A destination address might be a unicast address. It might be a multicast address. A multicast address is destined to for more than one device. A broadcast address is destined for all of the devices in the network. Now, broadcasts are an IPv4 concept. There are no broadcasts in IPv6. IPv6 does not have any broadcast addresses. That's not to say it doesn't have functionality comparable to a broadcast address but it implements this via a particular multicast address instead. Any cast address type is unique to IPv6. Within any cast, you have multiple different devices that are sharing an IP address. And a packet that is sent to this IP address, this any cast address, is going to be sent by the router to whatever of those devices happen to be nearest for an IPv6 multicast addresses. And the IPv6 multicast addresses were designed in such a way that if you know the IPv4 multicast address, you can probably figure out what its IPv6 uh, multicast corresponding address would happen to be. So for example, if you know that the all OSPF routers multicast address is 224.0.0.5, you should be able to figure out that the IPv6 equivalent is going to be FF02 colon colon 5. The designated router, the DR, VDR, the all designated router, 
multicast address 224.0.0.6 corresponds to the IPv6 SS02 colon colon 6. Now the EIGRP multicast ones might look different at first glance, but keep in mind that they're in different bases. IPv4 multicast addresses, as are all IPv4 addresses, are decimal. So the quantity represented by 10 in decimal is the same as the quantity represented by A in hexadecimal, as in the IPv6 address. Both 10 decimal and A hexadecimal represents the quantity that the number of fingers that most people have. As you know, a network could be a point-to-point -point network that has only two devices connected to it. It could be a broadcast network. A broadcast network has the capability of having more two than two devices, and you're allowed to send broadcasts. So in a broadcast network, a device can send a broadcast that will be received by all of the other devices in the network. NBMA networks, non-broadcast multi-access networks, are just what their name sounds like. They're multi-access, so like a broadcast network, you can have more than two devices on it. But as its name implies, you're not allowed to have broadcasts in an NBMA network. And as we'll see in subsequent slides, NBMA, NBMA networks, um, such as those um, involving frame relay or ATM, can pose some challenges. So I made mention of frame relay earlier. Frame relay can be used to connect multiple different remote devices. If we could, in theory, have separate lease lines connecting corp to each of the branch routers. That could very rapidly get to be expensive. Instead, we can save a lot of money if we use frame relay. With frame relay, each of the different routers will have one lease line connecting to the frame relay provider. And that one lease line, that one physical line, can be divided into multiple um, sub-interfaces, each sub-interface being a virtual line, if you will. So the corp router would have one physical connection to the frame relay switch, but it could have a separate sub-interface to each of the spoke routers. The sub-interfaces would be in different networks. Apologies. See that NBMA networks have some different challenges associated with them. One is involved with the split horizon rule for distance vector protocols. The other is involved with the election of the DR and the BDR with OSPF. You'll recall that the split horizon rule says that when a router receives a routing update on a given interface, it is not allowed to send that update out that same physical interface, or that same interface. One solution that you could have is to create sub-interfaces so that um, update will come in on one sub-interface and will be allowed to go out another sub-interface. Another solution is simply disable split horizon if you've got a hub and spoke topology. The next problem comes with NBMA networks over which OSPF is running. If you have a non-broadcast multiple access network, as far as OSPF is concerned, it's a multi-access network, and you need to elect a DR. The problem is that only the hub is able to communicate directly with each of the spokes, so the hub must be the DR. The solution basically is rig the election, make sure that the hub will be elected as the DR. The, using an NBMA network, you can basically have a simulation of broadcast by having the message that you would have ideally liked to have broadcast, be placed, have identical copies of it be sent out unicast to each of the recipients. Obviously, this is going to be using a lot of bandwidth and is not an ideal sort of situation. We're going to be reviewing now the TCP headers for IPv4 and IPv6. A few things to note. 
IPv4 uses a 32-bit or 4-byte word. IPv6 uses a 64-bit or 8-byte word. In each case, the base headers are going to have five words. So IPv4, assuming you do not have any options, you're going to have 20 bytes for the header. IPv6, you will always have 40 bytes for the header. Um, headers have some fields that are identical in name and functionality. Other fields that might have different names but have comparable functionality. So the first field in both header types is the version field. IPv4 contains the number 4 in it. IPv6 contains the number 6 in it. Pretty straightforward. The only question is, what happened to 5? Why did we go right from 4 to 6? Well, there was a protocol called Internet Stream Protocol that made use of the number 5. But ISP, in the sense of Internet Stream Protocol, never really uh, took off. So when I, um, the next version of IP came around, it wasn't going to use 5 just in case there might be a possibility of confusion. Therefore, the number 6 was used. IPv4 header length is variable. Depending on what options you have with IPv4, if you don't have any options, the header length is going to be 20 bytes. But it might always be more than 20 bytes if you have options. So we have an IHL field to specify just how much of how many bits that the recipient are receiving are header bits and where the payload begins. IPv6 does not have a need for an internet header link simply because the IPv6 header is always going to be 40 bytes. The type of service field in the IPv4 header does basically the same thing as the traffic class field for IPv6. Both are used for quality of service. The flow label is a field unique to IPv6. And if you have a communication, maybe you're in a webinar, and the webinar has a chat session going on. Um, there's a pane that is sharing a PowerPoint presentation, another pane that it has a uh, webcam on the presenter. You've got these different flows going on that need to be coordinated. And the flow labels can help in a situation such as that. IPv4 has a total length field. If you want to find out the size of the payload in IPv4, all you need to do is subtract uh, the IHL field's value from the total length value, and you can get the payload information. With IPv6, in contrast, you have a payload length, the length of, of the payload. The base header is always going to be 40 bytes. The functional equivalent of IPv4's options in IPv6 are extension headers. And extension headers plus the payload, the data, together make up the uh, are used to determine the payload length. So here, the options in IPv4 header are included as part of the IHL field in IPv4. In IPv6, there is no counterpart to the IHL field. Instead, you might, well, instead, the size of the main header and IPv6 is always going to be 40 bytes. Any optional extension headers are going to be included along with uh, the da data to calculate the payload length. Graciously, it actually has a couple of different mechanisms in which it can handle fragmentation. Keep in mind that your packet is going to be traversing different networks. And depending on what Layer 2 technologies and Layer 1 technologies are being used, you might have a different maximum transmission unit size for the different networks. 
what happens if PCA wants to try to send out a packet and it has an MTU size, a particular MTU size based on this link. It sends out the packet and it's a large packet. Small enough to fit on this link, but it's still pretty large. R2 is now um, wants to send the packet to R3, but this link has a much smaller MTU. What R2 can do is it can fragment the packet, take the original packet, break it up into smaller packets. Each of the smaller packets will have the same identification number to identify it as being part of that same original packet. Each of the packets will have a different fragment offset, and the fragment offset says where, which part of the original packet this was, so, it can, so that the end destination can put these sub-packets, if you will, into, back into the proper order. Now, MTU is, um, is the maximum transmission unit over a particular link. The corresponding layer 4 concept is MSS, maximum segment size. And if you wish to avoid fragmentation of an IPv4 packet, you have to make sure that the MSS is at least 40 bytes smaller than the MTU, because 20 bytes are going to be used for the IP header, possibly more if you've got options. 20 bytes will be used for the TCP header. So if you add the 20 bytes from the IP header, 20 bytes from the TCP header, plus the MSS, you want to make sure that that's not going to be any greater than the MTU. Fragmentation is, or one method of dealing with different MTUs, I should say, is fragmenting the packet. Another approach is to use path MTU discovery. What happens here is suppose this PC wished to send something to a device over here. What it can do is, before it starts sending out any actual data, is it creates a packet with bogus data. And it makes it large enough so that it can be sent out on the network that it's connected with. It will have as one of its flags a don't fragment flag. And it will just see, can this packet get from the self to the end destination? Well, it gets to this router just fine. But now, it gets, uh, when it tries to go into, go to this router, we've got a shorter, a smaller MTU here. This router sees the don't fragment flag on the packet, so it just drops the packet. If it can't fragment it, it will just drop it. But then it will send back an ICMP destination unreachable message to the original sender, and part of that destination unreachable message will be an indication of what the MTU size is, the largest MTU that it can handle, and yet sends the data into this new network. So IPv4 has these two different methods of dealing with different MTUs. In point of practice, this PMTUD is largely what is done. Nowadays, typically, the only time that you're likely to see fragmentation with um, IP packets is if you're dealing with an attacker stopped by the target's intruder detection system. The way to try to circumvent those devices is to fragment the packet. In general, with IPv4, for non-malicious uh, traffic, you're probably not going to be seeing fragmentation. IPv6 does not permit fragmentation. IPv6 is going to be using something akin to the PMTUD. Again, if we're dealing with IPv6, a bogus packet, if you will, using the maximum MTU of this connection and see how far it gets. If it doesn't get to the destination because of a link that has a smaller MTU, the router that's connected to that link will drop the, the packet and will send back an ICMP v6 packet to big message, 
which specifies what MTU should be used. It's just a bunch of ones and zeros. The recipient gets this IP packet. It recognizes that this is an IPv4 packet. And it recognizes that after uh, 20 bytes, the IHL indicates that there are no options. After 20 bytes, the ones and zeros that follow are going to be the payload for this packet. But what is the payload? Is it a TCP segment? Is it a UDP datagram? Maybe it's an ICMP message. It's this protocol field that specifies how to interpret the ones and zeros that come after the header. The IPv6 counterpart to the protocol field is the next header field. The difference being that the next header can specify not only things such as TCP, UDP, ICMP, it can also specify extension headers, IPv6, with the IPv4 time to live field, the TTL field. When I first heard about TTL fields and what it did, I wondered, why is it not called something like hops to live or routers to live? Why is it time to live? Well, once upon a time, it actually really was the time to live, that the router would decrement the amount of time that it spent processing the packet from the TTL value. But as dropped such that uh, you were getting fractional values that had to be rounded to rounded up to be one. So it, in point of practice now, the time to live field just, you automatically decrement by one each time you hit a router. When you hit, come to zero, the packet is dropped. IPv6 has to be decrementing with each hop. So it's no longer officially called a TTL field or time to live field. It's officially called the hop limit. Now, in point of practice, people who've been in the field a while typically are very often going to be calling it, still calling it the TTL field just because of their familiarity with IPv4. But if you really want to be technical, it's the hop limit field. Source and destination addresses you should be very familiar with. IPv4 having 32-bit addresses, IPv6 having 128-bit addresses. But IPv6 does not have a counterpart, because in IPv6, layer 4 protocols, uh, both TCP and UDP, have checksum uh, built into them, so we don't need a uh, checksum for IP, uh, IPv6. IPv4 headers, as I made mention before, are variable length. After the mandatory initial 20 bytes, you might very well have additional options. And the options can vary in terms of the number of bits that are included. However, the packet has to have a certain even number, a certain number of words, a whole number of words. So if our options only were 20 bits worth, we would just fill in junk bits, so to speak. We would be padding with 12 additional bits just so that we would have a full word to transmit. Again, IPv6 headers, fixed 40 bytes. I already talked about the uh, next header possibly pointing to extension headers. And the advantage of this particular layout over what we have with IPv4 is that it's very easy if we decide we need additional functionality, it's easy to create a new extension header type and be able to implement it. And we don't have to worry about having changes in the header size. Having a nice standard sized header permits you to have more efficient processing. You can look over this slide on your own, gives uh, some common extension headers, uh, their numbers and their values, what they do. And you might have multiple different extension headers in a given packet. We're switching topics completely now. And we're going to be talking about LFNs, long, fat networks, and how they work with TCP. Imagine a physical pipe, a plumbing pipe. And you want to put some water in it. The wider the pipe, the more water you can get in. The longer the pipe, the more water you can get in. Or if you're looking at layer 4 uh, path from source to destination, the higher the bandwidth, the longer the distance between the two, the more bits 
you could have in transit from one device to another and back again. If we do not fine-tune our TCP window size, we're not going to be able to take full advantage of the bandwidth at our disposal. You'll recall that the TCP window determines how much data a sender can send before receiving an acknowledgment. The number of bits that are on the line, or that can potentially be on the line, is reflected by the term uh, bandwidth delay product is like the width of the pipe. The delay would be like the distance or the length of the pipe. And the bandwidth delay product is going to be determined by multiplying the bandwidth in terms of bits per second by the round trip time in terms of seconds. And because the round trip time it generally tends to be measured in uh, fraction, very small fractions of a second, Bandwidth is rarely represented in bits per second. It's typically going to be megabits or to drop a zero or a three zeros in the math. So there are some nice little utilities that are easily available online that makes the math easy for you to determine what uh, the bandwidth delay product happens to be. Illustrations of what can happen if you've got an LFN, a long fat network. So long network, high bandwidth. First of all, ping. Ping does not make use of TCP, doesn't make use of Windows. It's just going to be sending a packet, receiving a packet, sending one packet, receiving a packet. Here we have a TCP session in which the window size was not configured according to the bandwidth delay product. We send some data, and then we have to wait until we get the acknowledgments before we can send additional data. So you can see there are times that we're not making use of the bandwidth at all. Other times that bandwidth is being used, but not to a maximum extent. If you do have the fine tuning, you can keep sending data even while you're receiving the acknowledgments of your bandwidth. P, but shifting topics a bit, is TCP starvation. TCP is polite. UDP is a bully. If you've got high congestion, a period of high congestion, TCP recognizes it and it will lower its window size. So it will wait to receive acknowledgments, and it won't make use of anywhere near as much of the bandwidth as it might otherwise. UDP has no such compunction. UDP, if there's congestion, if there's no congestion, it doesn't care. It's going to send data, and it's going to send a lot of data, all the data that it wants to send. So in a case of high bandwidth time, basically, TCP is going to back off. TCP is like the child who sees there's a plate of cookies and there's some other kids who want to share, and they, it just takes one cookie or co two or three cookies. UDP is the hog that eats up all of the cookies for it, uh, itself and just doesn't care about the other kids. So TCP is going to have a slow start. It's going to see, oh, there's a lot of congestion, make its window very slow or very small and gradually try increasing the window size. Multiple devices that wish to send, and they all see at the same time that there's a congestion, they all back off and low, greatly lower their window size at the same time. They all start increasing their window size at the same time. And as they increase their window size, they're using up more of the bandwidth, and there's going to be more congestion, and they'll all back off at the same time. Lather, rinse, repeat. All the more bandwidth for me why TCP starvation is sometimes also called UDP dominance. Synchronization, where you've got multiple devices that all back off at the same time, all start increasing their window size at the same time, is using WRED, Weighted Random Early Detection. The idea here is you have configured the devices to have different thresholds so that some will back off sooner than others, basically. Um, some will back off at one level of congestion. Others will wait till a higher level of congestion is reached before they start backing off. And that avoids the TCP synchronization. This brings to mind a quote that should be familiar to any Star Trek fan. Uh, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Shift topics again. And we're going to look at ICMP redirects. With ICMP v4, if you had a situation like this, where you've got 
say two different routers sharing a network. R2 is the router that is most easily able to get to network X, has the best that's the way of getting to network X. PCA happens to be configured with R1 as its default router. PCA wants to send something to network X, so of course it sends it to R1, being its default gateway. And R1 does forward the package to R2 to send to network X, but it then also will send back to PCA a message basically saying, hey, in the future, if you wish to send anything to network X, send it directly to R2. So that's the ICMP redirect. IPv6 ICMP redirect can do the exact same thing, has the exact same functionality, but it goes above and beyond. Not only will it work in this situation, it will also work in a situation where PCA and PCB share a link, but are on different layer 3 networks. I'm sure you know from your CCNA studies that this is not a best practice, but if you do have a situation like this, PCA wishes to send something to PCB, they share the link, but because they are on different layer 3 networks, PCA sends the packet to R1, which in turn forwards it to PCB, but sends an IPv6 uh, redirect, ICMP redirect message back to PCA, saying in the future, you can send messages for PCB directly on your link, you're sharing a link. Now, changing directions once again, which is actually rather appropriate given our next topic, we'll be talking about asymmetric routing. This is a topic that is not really discussed in the uh, textbook, the companion guide, but if you look at the official CCNA, CCNP route uh, certification study guide, it is discussed in there, and this example is taken from that guide. So the idea here is, when you're dealing with layer 3 networks, it's not at all uncommon for a packet going from A to B to follow one route, but then the reply packet going from B to A to take a different route. That's perfectly normal operation, not a problem, typically. But consider this situation. Here we have a VLAN that's spanning two access layer switches. This is not a best practice, but we have this right now. So the access layer switches are both connected to layer three distribution layer three switches that are distribution layer switches. So these switches are acting at layer two, pointing towards the access layer, and at layer three, pointing towards the core switch, CS1 at the core layer. At this point, DSW1 is our active uh, router, and DSW1, therefore, is serving as the default gateway to PC1. PC1 sends something out to the Internet, and therefore, it sends it to its ASW1, which is going to send it um, to DSW1, which is going to send it to CSW1 and out to the Internet. So far, so good. The reply comes in. CSW1 low balances between DSW1 and DSW2. So sometimes it's going to send data back the way it came. We're interested in the situation where it sends it back to D through to DSW2. Now, suppose an hour ago, PC1 had sent something to PC2. PC1 sent something through ASW1, it would have gone through DSW2 to ASW2 to PC2. So an hour ago, DSW2 learned some information from the frame that it received from PC1. It learned what PC1's IP address is, and it could add an entry into its ARP table mapping PC1's IP address with its MAC address. It also learned, based on the port on which the frame came in on, what port it should use to send um, data destined for PC1, and it enters that information into its CAM table. CAM table being another name for the MAC address table. And an hour ago, everything was beautiful. If the reply 
had come uh, from Via Kinetic come back an hour ago, what would have happened would have been DCW2 would have seen, oh, the packet is destined for um, 10.1.1.100 PC1. I will look at my ARP table to find out what uh, destination MAC address I should use in the frame that I'm creating. And it uses that. Look, then it looks in its CAM table to see out of which port it will send the frame. And it sends it out. And all is well and good. But that was an hour ago. That's not now. You see, the situation is that the ARP table entry that was made an hour ago will still be in uh, DCW's ARP table. Because DCW um, does not age out ARP entries for, until four hours has elapsed. So, so far so good. D DSW creates the new frame that it wants to send out using the information from its ARP cache. It determines the appropriate MAC address for PC1. And then it goes to look in its CAM table to find out which port it should send this frame out of. However, the CAM table is timing out in five minutes. The last it had heard from PC1 was an hour ago. The CAM table entry that had been there an hour ago is no longer there. So you know what a switch will do if it needs to send out a frame and it doesn't have an entry in its CAM table, it floods the frame out of all the ports except the one that it came in on. Well, that's not that big a deal for one frame. But what if PC1 had um, sent out a request to watch a streaming video, a movie? A lot of packets are going to be coming in from the internet. Assuming we have equal cost load balancing here and uh, we're sharing fully equally lo load balancing, half of those packets are going to go to DSW2. You'll notice that after DSW2 flooded that first frame, it still didn't have an entry in its CAM table for PC1. Assuming PC1 is silent all this time, the user's just sitting back watching the streaming video, then when the next packet or, comes into DSW2 and the next packet and the next packet from the streaming video, DSW2 for every single packet is going to be stripping uh, the frame header and trailer off of it, creating a new frame, not knowing where to send the new frame, and flooding the traffic to not just to uh, out of this port, but also out of this port, out of any other connected ports, except the port on which it came in on. Clearly, that is not an ideal situation, not an ideal use of bandwidth. That's one of the reasons why having a VLAN that spans more than one access switch is not considered a best practice at this point. And there are a couple of different resolutions for this. The first and most obvious one is don't have a topology like this. Don't have a VLAN spanning more than one access switch. The other solution is to tweak the timers for the CAM table and the ARP table. Our problem came because we had an entry in the ARP table, but we did not have a corresponding entry in the CAM table. Suppose that our ARP timer had been set to be less than or equal to that of our CAM table timer. So they were both five minutes. And the last we heard from uh, PC1 was an hour ago. So there's no entry in either the ARP table or the CAM table for PC1. Now, when DSW receives a packet that's destined for PC1, it will look to its ARP table to find out what um, MAC address to use, but it will not come up with anything. Its ARP table does not have anything relevant. So it's going to be sending out an ARP request um, to all and sundry. You know, what, uh, here's the IP address that I know about. What is, you know, what did, which of you has this IP address and what's your corresponding MAC address? PC1 will reply. And now, based on the reply that DSW2 receives, it not only knows the IP address and MAC address of PC1 and it's able to put uh, mapping into its ARP table, but also, based on the port that the ARP reply came in on, it will add an entry into its CAM table or MAC address table for PC1. So yes, it's true that the ARP cache, or I'm sorry, the ARP request was flooded. But 
after that now, DSW2 has that entry in the ARP cache and uh, the CAM table both. So subsequent packets received will not have to be flooded until the um, table's entries age out. That is connecting remote locations. This slide has a lot on it that should all be reviewed. So please go ahead and read it on your own. And as always, if you have any questions at all, anything you don't understand, do please feel free to ask. EP and frame relay. However, I just want to say at their most basic, both of them simply involve the term encapsulation and then either PPP or frame relay as a keyword for encapsulation as an interface configuration command. You should know about PPP in your CCNA studies. Depending on when you first started studying for your CCNA certification, you may or may not have learned uh, frame relay configuration. Uh, my understanding is frame relay, um, it has been or it's very, very soon to be dropped from the CCNA curriculum, depending on when you listen to this. Relay configuration, they're very, very different, but at their most basic, the only difference, if you can see, I flip between these two slides, the only difference in the configuration is PPP versus frame relay. Uh, PPP, of course, um, is used instead of HDLC in a lot of places because, amongst other reasons, it permits authentication, which HDLC does not. We talked about uh, problems with frame relay in terms of dealing with things like uh, designated router election. We'll talk about frame relay, frame relay a little more in subsequent chapters. What we'll be talking about in this video is VPNs, or Virtual Private Network. If you wish to have confidential communications with other devices, you could set up leased lines. That gets to be really expensive. You could have frame relay as well. That's another option. But an option that is increasingly used is VPNs, or virtual private networks. The idea here is that you'll be able to create a VPN tunnel through which data will be sent over something like the internet, over other people's networks, in a confidential fashion between yourself and the destination, except you don't have the expense of the lease line. There are different types of VPNs that are available. MPLS-based VPNs, tunnel-based VPNs, or hybrids between the two. We'll be focusing for the most part on VPN tunnels. Uh, we will be looking briefly at MPLS-based VPNs. So with an MPLS-based VPN, you take your original um, data that you wish to transmit, and you insert a 32-bit label as you're coming into the provider um, equipment, the, route, the key router. And that label then will be removed at the other end of the tunnel. MPLS Based VPNs can be layered to and layer two or layer three. If you have a layer two based VPN, then from the customer's perspective and the, from the perspective of configuring the customer's router, the MPLS uh, provider network looks just like a switch. With a layer three MPLS based VPN. From the customer's perspective and configuration perspective, it is as if the Layer 3 MPLS-based VPN is just another router that is participating in the routing protocols that are being used by the customer. And virtual routing and forwarding, it's use of virtual routing and forwarding, which basically is going to be um, having the service provider having, an, in essence, a separate routing table for each of its different customers. And there might be a route to the 10.0.0.0 network for one customer in its virtual routing table, and a route to a 10.0.0.0, a different 10.0.0.0 network, to another customer's uh, network in another virtual routing table. And that is OK, because the different virtual routing tables are kept completely distinct by the service provider. And 
the advantage of this is that, again, from the customer's perspective, the provider equipment just looks like another router. So if the customer is running EIGRP, the provider is going to run EIGRP and be able to be in um, communication with the customer's routers and be able to have um, routing updates sent over the service provider's network. And also, one thing that you need to know about is that although many tunnels do encrypt data, not all of them do. If you have a pure GRE tunnel, for example, the data will be sent in plain text. GRE stands for Generic Routing Encapsulation, not, not, not Generic Routing Encryption. So a GRE tunnel will not be encrypted. Well, why in the world would you want to have a tunnel that's not encrypted? Why would you use GRE? You often use GRE in conjunction with IPsec, as we'll see in, uh, shortly. There are a variety of different tunneling protocols. We're going to be looking briefly at IPsec and GRE. We're not going to be touching on the other tunneling protocols today. The idea with the tunnel is you've got certain data that you'd like to be protected, and you're going to be adding on tunnel headers. Uh, if you're dealing with pure GRE, GRE in its purest form is going to be a point-to-point -point tunnel, and send pretty much any sort of data you want, unicast, multicast, a variety of different routing protocols. But again, it doesn't encrypt anything. There's no security. RE with IPsec. And the two actually work really well t with each other because each uh, complements the other. Each one has a weakness that the other compensates for. GRE's weakness is that it does not encrypt the data. Data is sent in plain text. IPsec's weakness is that it can only handle unicast. It cannot handle multicast traffic. But with GRE, you can take traffic that is originally multicast, put it in a GRE tunnel, and GRE will basically, in essence, unicast that data. You take the multicast um, data, you put on GRE headers, and you unicast the GRE sec, which is then, in turn, going to encrypt the data. With VPN, you probably want a secure VPN. What are the characteristics of the secure VPN? First of all, it's going to have authentication. So you're sure that the data that you receive and the data or comes from the source that it claims to come from. The way you would do that is um, the sender would create a hash of the data, including the original IP header that has the original physical interface's IP address of the source and of the destination. That all is going to be, along with the data, um, hashed. And the hash value will be sent with the original IP header, the original data, to the destination. The destination will receive all of this, will compute its own hash based on the original IP header and data. And if the, its computed hash matches the received hash, it knows that the message was, in fact, sent from the source that it claimed to have been sent from. If the hashes don't match, it's going to assume that there was a problem, and it's going to deal with it accordingly uh, by using encryption so that if somebody eavesdrops along the way, they get what just appears to be gibberish. Of course, with encryption, you're going to need to have keys, and both the sender and receiver are going to have to have common understanding of the keys. The integrity, then the data as you receive it, is identical to the data as it was originally sent. There was no tampering along the way. You have anti-replay protection. If somebody along the way manages to record the data and tries to retransmit the data, it will be recognized for what it is, a retransmission and not the original. So as I made mention, IPsec can only deal with unicast. GRE can deal with multicast, and um, the GRE encapsulated multicast will, with the encapsulation, be a unicast, which IPsec can send. It's a specification for being able to use several other protocols. IPsec, despite its name, does not 
necessitate encryption. IPsec is frequently used with encryption, but it does not have to be. And IPsec comes at layer three, so anything that's sent be encrypted. There's no authentication of the frame header and trailer. You have no um, data integrity check with IPsec from the data header or uh, trailer. IPsec basically just is going to be dealing with uh, layer three and higher encryption. IPsec. Ike deals with the key exchange so that the sender and the receiver both have the keys to be able to use for encryption and decryption. Uh, but anyone who tries to um, intercept the communication would not be able to ha would not have the keys and would not be able to decrypt the data. If you're not interested in encryption, you're interested in authentication. For the, um, so not only authentication but data integrity, uh, maybe anti-replay. You could use uh, the authentication header AH. If you do wish to have encryption, you cannot use AH. You would need to use Encapsulated Security Protocol, or ESP. ESP can do everything that AH can do, and it can also encrypt the data. In fact, that's why you would use, the primary reason why you would use ESP is because you want not just um, authentication, not just data integrity. Uh, you would also want the confidentiality. And AH and ESP are in either or. You'd use one or the other. You would not use both at the same time. ESP, in turn, has some different encryption methods it can use. I will not go so far as to say that DES data encryption standard is as weak as plain text. It isn't. DES will deter the most casual of eavesdroppers from understanding what's being said. However, if you have a hacker that has really any knowledge about hacking at all, any determination at all, they'll be able to figure out the message pretty quickly. DES is pretty weak. Triple DES is better. Um, it's definitely more secure than DES. If those are your only alternatives, then go for triple DES. Uh, AES is much more secure than either of the other two. It will be a little, require a little bit more um, resources, um, a little bit more computationally intense. But if you need a confidentiality, and if your devices are able to handle AES, AES is definitely the way to go. Now, with VPN security, you're actually making use of several different protocols. First, there's the passenger protocol, the original IP packet that you want to transmit. Then you've got the encapsulating protocol, or, pro or protocols, plural, such as uh, GRE or IPsec. Finally, you have the carrier protocol, which is the layer two protocol that is um, going to be used for transmitting over so frame, lead, frame relay, PPP, et cetera. IPsec has two different encryption modes, transport mode and tunnel mode. With transport mode, you're encrypting the payload from the original IP packet, but not the original IP header. There's only one IP header in transport mode, and that's the original one, which is not going to be encrypted. You're not going to be having, if you're using AH, you wouldn't be encrypting in any event, but you would, you would not have any of the benefits of IPsec for the header. You would not have um, the data integrity check. You would not have authentication of the header, IP header. Tunnel mode, you preserve the original IP packet completely intact. You have your ESP or AH header, but now you've got a new IP header. And this new IP header is going to have different source and destination addresses than the original one. The original IP header is going to be having the having as their source and destination IP addresses the addresses that are assigned to the physical interfaces of the source and destination. The new IP header will have IP addresses that are assigned to the tunnel endpoints. So anybody who's eavesdropping would be able to find out the tunnel IP addresses, but not the physical IP address. I made mention before that GRE, in its purest form, is a point-to-point -point protocol. It connects two devices. It's physical lines. You could use GRE just in its purest form. So you've got one point-to-point -point tunnel here, another point-to-point -point tunnel here, and so on. 
But suppose that these purple uh, pipes are not physical least lines. Suppose this is frame relay and we're dealing with sub interfaces and uh, virtual connections between the hubs and the spokes. In this situation, we cannot use GRE in its purest form because each physical interface with a pure GRE is only allowed one tunnel, full tunnels per physical interface. So one physical interface is being used here, but each of these different sub interfaces can have their own tunnel. So with multi-point GRE, you can configure each of these devices to have a tunnel with each of its neighbors. We could have fully meshed or partially meshed topology here with the tunnels. Configuring all of these individual tunnels is going to become more and more time consuming, more and more error prone as you're spending more time doing this, more complicated, not a very good prospect. This is where dynamic multi-point VPNs come in. Dynamic multi-point VPNs make use of multi-point GRE. E lets you have multiple tunnels coming off of the same physical interface, but it does not other spoke routers. We're going to turn briefly to the next top resolution protocol. And here is, if you're using NHRP, you configure each device to know about its own physical addresses and its own uh, tunnel IP address. When each of the spokes communicates with headquarters, it basically tells headquarters, here's my physical IP address and here's my tunnel IP address. And the headquarters adds that information into its NHRP database, both the physical IP address and the tunnel IP address. This will come in very useful when we're dealing with DMVPN. So suppose branch C wishes to communicate with branch B, and we're using DMVPN. Branch C knows its own IP addresses. It knows that branch B um, it wants to communicate via a tunnel, and the destination endpoint of the tunnel is uh, 10.0.0.2, but it does not know what the physical address is for branch B. What it will do is it will query headquarters, and headquarters will look up the information in its um, NHRP database and return that information to branch C, which branch C can now dynamically create a tunnel for branch B. And congratulations, you made it through the first part of our Chapter 1 discussion. Go ahead and take a break, and when you're ready, come back to the second video.